Good evening, everyone, on behalf of the Jewish Network for Palestine. I'm very happy to welcome you to this important event. There are a hundred of you uh, or so, um, uh, and there, are, um, there will be more um, because we're streaming this event on Facebook. Before introducing this event speaker, I have a couple of short announcements. Please, uh, I ask you all to mute yourself now, if not already done so, and disconnect your video through the little button on the bottom left at the, of the screen. You may reconnect your video at the Q&A stage, and we would ask you to do so. This event is being recorded and you will um, and will be shared on our JMP website later this week, so people who missed it uh, will be able to see it. The Q and A se session will take place immediately after the talk of about forty-five minutes duration. Um, to uh, ask a question, put it into the chat, and raise your electronic hand if connected by Zoom. Um, I hope that we shall not experience any attempts of disruption, as any such attempt will lead to immediate expulsion from the webinar. Now, the last bit of information. The Jewish Network for Palestine will launch a series of three special webinars on the history and importance of the Arab Jews in Israel, the Mizrahim, during March and early April. More details will be available soon on our website and Facebook pages, where people can also join JNP, which is open to everyone who shares our aims, not only to Jews. Finally, I wish to thank our chair of JNP, David Cannon, for assistance in setting up this complicated meeting, and Dr. Les Levidau, our host for, for tonight for dealing with the technical aspects behind the scenes. Now, I would like to introduce our speaker, who of course needs no introduction. Professor Ilan Pape, historian of the Nakba, is director of the European Center for Palestine Studies at Exeter University, where he worked since 2007 after leaving Haifa University. I'm sure Ilan will mention why he left Haifa University in his talk. Professor Pape is the author of too many books than we can list here, but I must mention some. A History of Modern Palestine, One Land, Two Peoples in 2003. The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, 2007. The Idea of Israel, 2012. The Forgotten Palestinians, A History of the Palestinians in Israel, 2013. 10 Myths About Israel, 2017. The Biggest Prison on Earth, 2017. Yes, that's not a, prob uh, a mistake that I made. Uh, Ilan publishes two or three books a year. And the most recent are Liberation, edited with Ramzi Baroud, and the Historical Dictionary of Palestine, edited with Johnny Mansour, both came out this very month. Get them. Now, this very partial list is most impressive, but it includes less than a third of his books. What should be clear to all of you is that Ilan is not a historian merely recording the details of the Zionist project in Palestine and its many iniquities and crimes but a pioneer of conceiving and describing the conflict in a new conceptual framework, as one combining settler colonial practices, ethnic cleansing, and a racist apartheid regime of, extremely, of extreme brutality and inbred inequality. In doing that, he is unique also covering so many aspects of the colonial conflict. Now, um, few words are in order to connect Ilan to the topic of tonight. While working at Haifa University, Ilan attracted many students, Israeli Jews and Palestinians, who wished to conduct research on the topics silenced by the Israeli regime 
and its control machinery. Some of these students con conducted um, uh, innovative research led by Ilan into hidden corners of Zionist history and some suffered for it. No one more than Teddy Katz, the man at the center of tonight's presentation. Of course, this story is also Ilan's story, as well as that of the silent survivors of the Tantura massacre. I'm very happy to have with us tonight, Professor Ilan Pape, who will now tell us the story of the Tantura massacre and its silencing for so many decades, and also about the difficulties of conducting historical research in Israel. Ilan, please. Thank you, Chaim. Uh, let me see that I'm, I'm not muted very well. Thank you, Chaim, and thank you everyone for joining us uh, this evening. And I want to send to uh, uh, thank again all the organizers who, who toiled and made this uh, event uh, uh, possible. In the late uh, 1990s, I was teaching uh, uh, in the Department of Middle Eastern History at Haifa University. One of my most popular courses was uh, named uh, the Nakba, popular modules, we would call them in England, I suppose, which sometimes I, I was forced to reframe as the history and historiography of 1948 uh, under the pressure of uh, the university's management. The main assignment in that particular module was uh, a request from students to research what occurred in 1948 uh, in the places where they lived or where they were born into. Uh, there was one extraordinary student older than me, one should say, his name was Teddy Katz, and he responded eagerly to the assignment and he found out that his kibbutz, Kibbutz Magal, was founded on the ruins of the village Zeta Katz was and remained in a way Zionist, naively believing that you could square the circle and advocate a liberal humanist version of Zionism, an absurd belief to my mind, in an enlightenment, uh, uh, as, as absurd as the idea of an enlightened colonialism. Part of what unfolded later has to do, I think, with this misguided perception of reality and explains his behavior later on. This is why, after finding out about Zeta, he tried also to invite the survivors of the 1948 destroyed village, living still inside the 1948 areas, to visit and maybe even talk to the settlers who overtook the village, but he was scorned and castigated by his fellow members of the kibbutz. Katz wished to continue with 1948 for his master thesis. And I suggested writing a microhistory of villages affected by the Nakba. He completed his thesis in 1998, and its title was The Exodus of the Arabs from the Village on the Slopes of the Carmel Mountain. The language he used for this uh, thesis is important. Exodus and Arabs are part of a Zionist discourse to which Katz subscribed, and yet he was about to become, for a while, public enemy number one in the eyes of the Zionist academia and media. He chose five Palestinian villages and tried to reconstruct what happened to them uh, during the Nakba. All of them were located south of Haifa and on the Mediterranean coast. I declined to be his supervisor as I was already known as an anti-Zionist scholar and at odds with the university over how to teach and research the history of Palestine. Thus, he chose Kais Firo, a Druze scholar, who at the time was highly respected among his peers at the University of Haifa. The thesis received the highest possible grade. In chapter four of the thesis, Katz told the story of Tantura. He did not know beforehand what he would find. Working on the other villages, he found enough documentation and oral testimonies to tell the story of the ethnic cleansing of these five villages. To his surprise, both Zionist soldiers 
and villagers from Tantura told him about the massacre that occurred in the village both on the 22nd and the 23rd of May, 1948, while and after the village was occupied by the Israeli army. His surprise was mainly due to the fact that the major works already in existence at the time, such as Walid Khalidi's All That Remains and uh, Benny Morris, The Birth of the Palestinian Refugee Problem, did not mention the massacre. In fact, the massacre was already reported by Nimr al-Hatib in his memoirs Min Athar and Nakba, published in Beirut in 1950, and were told by every, every now and then in meetings organized by the uh, Committee for Internal Refugees Inside Israel, uh, who included some survivors of Tantura. And if you visited the only two villages that Israel allowed to remain on the coast between Tel Aviv and Haifa, two out of 40 villages, uh, Jisar Azarka and Faradis, you would have heard from people who lived there and were originally from Tantura about the massacre, but not in the two seminal works at that moment, in 2000, Walid al-Halidi and Benny Morris's work. Then a, 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 a newspaper inside Israel, uh, Kul al-Arab, also carried interviews with survivors of the massacre before Teddy Katz wrote his thesis. But Katz's thesis was the first academic publication introducing the massacre. In the same year that Katz wrote his thesis, Mahmoud ibn Yahya published a book on Tantura in Damascus. He was from Tantura, as many refugees in the Yarmouk village, in Yarmouk refugee camp were from Tantura reporting a massacre pointing to 52 victims, including women who were slaughtered by the Israeli troops. Katz possessed tens, uh, more than, actually more than 100 hours of interviews uh, with Jews and Palestinians, which he recorded, who were involved in the occupation of Tantura and relied also of a handful of documents from the Israeli military archive. On the basis of this material, he concluded that around 200 to 250 of the villagers were either shot in cold blood by the army or were murdered during a stampede of angry soldiers through the village in response to the deaths of eight of their fellow soldiers in the initial attack on the village. The executions were on the beach and were graphically described by Jewish and Palestinian eyewitnesses and alluded to by the documents he found in the Israeli archives. The documents corroborated also the eyewitnesses claim that two mass graves were excavated near the graveyard, that is the ordinary graveyard of the village, to accommodate the bodies. The graves today are covered by a parking lot, the mass graves are, are covered by a parking lot belonging to the settlement Nakhcholim that was built on the ruins of Tantura. What was striking was how the evidence given by the troops complemented the one given by the survivors of Tantura. And thus this was historically a rare example where different perspectives fused into a complete picture of a past event. As mentioned, the thesis was written in 1998 Two years later, a journalist <coughs> who browsed through the University of Haifa's library found the thesis and published its finding on the massacre in a daily newspaper called Ma'ariv. The publication led to a libel suit by the veterans of the brigade, Alexandroni Brigade, whose soldiers perpetrated the massacre. When they found themselves in the public eye, the soldiers and leading historians at Haifa universities decided to act quickly to disqualify the student and his thesis. Under the pressure of their peers, those soldiers who had clearly been recorded by Katz confessing to their crimes in Tantura were persuaded to submit affidavits to the court denying their previous evidence. These veterans had very close ties with the university management. The main advocates were the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and the head of the history school. And both these uh, lecturers did not lose time in acting. 
They demanded from the student to give them the recording of the interviews. At the time, the student did not have to record, let alone share the recordings, and handed them over to the lawyers of the veterans. The tactics were clear. Now was the time to question the professionalism of the historian and not the massacre itself. From that moment onwards, either in the courtroom or in the various forums and committees, the University of Haifa appointed to examine the thesis. The question of the massacre was sidelined and only one issue was examined. How many of the hours of tapes recorded were accurately or inaccurately transcribed by the student? Whether it was the prosecutor of the, all the university members persecuting cuts, they all dealt with the discrepancies they could find between the tapes and the interviews on them and the quotes in the thesis. There were some discrepancies, very few and insignificant as far as the massacre was concerned, but they were enough to declare the student as unprofessional. I will remind you that in the first round, Cuts received the highest possible grade in the university. The few instances that found of the, description of the discrepancies were of blurred sentences in interviews with, with older Palestinian villagers, which were presented by the prosecutor and the university later as intended fabrications of the truth. Katz was presented with these inaccuracies on the first day of the, in the court. And after uh, a long day in court, he broke down. In the evening, at the office of the prosecutor, he wrote a letter of confession in which he stated that he fabricated the evidence of the massacre. It seems that the pressure of his family, his lawyers and the university lawyers caused him to write this letter, which he retracted 12 hours later, regretting doing it in the first place. The judge refused to accept the retraction, imposed on him the prosecution's expenses and demanded that he would publish a public apology. Katz refused, and this was taken to the Supreme Court that left the verdict of the uh, regional court as it were. Uh, the university did all it could to disqualify Katz. The first step was to use the discrepancies found by the prosecutor as a pretext from demanding a new thesis. Katz was willing to rewrite a new thesis and corrected all the discrepancies and added new discriminating evidence about the massacre. But this was, of course, not what the university wanted. So with the help of five anonymous new referees, the new thesis, a very uncommon number of referees, by the way, for an MA thesis in any university, the new thesis was not passed by the majority of the referees, whose verdict was that the dissertation was poorly written. Interesting. On the 9th of February, 2022, that is, well, a few, few weeks ago, uh, I don't know what the date is today, this month, anyway, uh, Professor Moshe Maoz from the Hebrew University wrote to Aretz that he found nothing. First of all, he admitted that he was one of the anonymous uh, examiners of the second thesis, and he stated that he found nothing that invalidated the argument about the massacre and gave actually the second version of the thesis a good grade. To his great surprise, his report was completely ignored by the university. The massacre was, however, not forgotten. I refer to it in my book, among other places, uh, uh, in my book, The Ethnic Lensing of Palestine, and Palestinian historians and writers noted it in their works, the most important of which was the work of Mustafa Al-Wali, published in 2001 in the Journal of Palestine Studies. The survivors of Tantura organized a com in a committee of their own, and, they, and whenever they can, they visit their old village if they live inside uh, Israel uh, that became a, a Zionist settlement. They organized an annual procession commencing on a parking lot covering the mass graves of the victims of the 1948 massacre and end up on the beach where the only building remaining intact of the village still stands, be it half ruined, and partly roofless. Katz's thesis was removed publicly from the library, a clear message to future students who would dare to challenge the Zionist narrative in a postgraduate works. We should recall that we are talking about 2001, 
the relative openness that the Oslo Accord brought to the academic works in Israel about the Nakba, represented by the works of the new historians who accepted major chapters in the Palestinian narrative, was long gone. After the Second Intifada, the leading new historian, Benny Morris, retracted his early criticism in his seminal work, The Birth of the Palestinian Refugee Problem, and was happy to re-adopt the Zionist narrative on the Nakba and to be re-embraced by the consensus of mainstream academia. The Jewish state moved politically to the right after 2000, and so did the universities. Katz became a pariah in his own kibbutz and suffered two strokes, and today this one energet once energetic person is crippled and in a wheeling chair. And I, as I was still a member of the faculty of the university, I did all I could to cause the university to change its attitude, a campaign that eventually cost me my job, despite being already a tenured lecturer. I was called to a special disciplinary court, and I was uh, uh, asked by the Ministry of Education and uh, uh, was targeted by the mainstream media, including the newspaper Haaretz, uh, uh, and the pressure grew to the point that I was unable to teach anymore uh, and had to look for a job outside of Israel. I also published in Hebrew and English uh, and articles based on my own research on Tantura, stating that there was a massacre in the village, but no one dared in Israel to take me to court. At the time, all the Israeli media, including the liberal Zionist paper Haaretz and the academic establishment, at best ridicule cuts and myself, at worst called us traitors. And now, an Israeli film director, Alon Schwartz, was able to catch up in the very last moment with the very same Jewish witnesses who denied their early evidence given to Katz back in 2001, and which was the basis for the court case. In their 90s, they confessed in the film, which I hope you all will be able to see, they confessed in front of the camera that Katz told them the truth and they recorded faithfully their versions of the events in 1948, namely their very clear and graphic evidence of the executions and the massacre inside the village. With the help of cutting edge technology, Schwartz was also able to uncover the mass graves of the victims, precisely in the location where both Jewish and Palestinian witnesses remembered it was. It's the first time that we have evidence for mass grave in the Nakba. We know that there are other, about 30 mass graves of Palestinian uh, uh, slaughtered in the Nakba, but we don't know yet where they are. This was the first one that we found. He also succeeded in prodding the judge who was sitting in the original trial to admit that she, her name was Dvora Pilpel, that she has never listened to the tapes. She was willing to listen in front of the camera and was horrified, you can see it in the film, and admitted that the verdict might have been very different as probably would have been Katz's life. Let me finish by three major conclusions and open it up because I'm sure you have a lot of questions and I'm not sure am I covering things that people know or don't know and I really just want this opening remarks to enable us to include as many people as and possible in the conversation. But let me conclude with three uh, uh, points. First, this episode, this episode, I'm sorry, this episode reintroduces the question of why it is important to collect Israeli and Zionist evidence about the Nakba. After all, Palestinians did not need the new historians to tell them that there was an ethnic cleansing in Palestine. And those who survive uh, Zionist massacres do not need documentary films to persuade them that they were victims of war crimes. However, when victims of a crime are the only witnesses, quite often, in particular if they are Palestinians, their evidence is not accepted in full or at all. But if the criminals admit to the crime, in this case, Israeli soldiers, for the world at large, and maybe for some conscientious Jews in Israel, suddenly the crime becomes a fact. Secondly, this episode recharts the borders of academic freedom in the only democracy in the Middle East, Israel. After 2000, postgraduate students and early career faculty members were discouraged from referring to the Nakba as a crime 
or a set of crimes. Moreover, the persecution of cuts and the overall censorship was followed in 2016 by a governmental decision to reclassify many of the archival documents of 1948, which had be once been accessible to researchers. Recently, some of them were reopened to some historians who rediscovered new war crimes in 1948, but can be trusted in the eyes of the establishment to attribute these crimes, can be trusted in, by the establishment not to attribute these crimes to Zionist, as ideology, to Zionist ideology as I did, for instance. And by the way, Katz did not. Decontextualizing and dehistoricizing the crimes are not accepted anymore in the scholarly work on the Nakba outside of Israel. And in the ever-growing new discipline of Palestine studies, which I'm very proud that we in Exeter contributed so much to legitimize Palestine studies as a, a legitimate path to postgraduate studies, and worldwide, this uh, uh, connection between the ideology and massacres and war crimes, whether in 1948 or last month, this connection is now substantiated and validated as the outcome of a research and not just as a polemic or political uh, uh, position. The resurface of the settler colonial paradigm in Palestine studies, first advocated by uh, anti-Zionist activists inside Israel and by Palestinian scholars such as Fayez Sayer and Jamil Hilal, indicates clearly that the logic informing the Zionist movement in 1948 and after was a logic common to all settler colonial movements elsewhere, the logic of the elimination of the native. Massacres thus are not exceptions that do not prove the rule. They are integral part of the colonization project in Palestine. And therefore we should never forget that the massacre was an overall crime against humanity Israel committed in 19, I'm sorry, we should not forget that, uh, that the ethnic cleansing was, uh, I have to rephrase what I want to say, I'm getting old and I'm tired. Okay, we should never forget that the massacre in Tantura was part of the overall crime against humanity Israel committed in 1948 and continues to perpetrate, perpetrate to this very day. A crime that is still widely denied Films or dissertation by conscientious Israeli Jews are not enough to rectify the crime. There is always a danger that liberal Zionists, scholars, or newspapers like Haaretz would like to own both the crime and the absolution. The Israeli call it shooting and crying, that is crying after the shooting, which cleanse your acts and conscience and allow you to repeat the crime actually once more in the future. Finally, and that's my final third point, it is crucial to understand that the only relevant closure for the ongoing criminality is the decolonization of all of historical Palestine and by the full implementation of the right of return. In a free and democratic historical Palestine, a memorial in Tantura could be a meaningful reminder of the past. When it only appears on the pages of a liberal Zionist paper like Haaretz, it will add insult to injury unless a more concrete rectification of the past evil would be undertaken. Thank you. Thank, thank you very, very much, Ilan, for a marvelous uh, speech. Um, I will uh, start rolling the question ball by asking you a question myself. Uh, and you have been... Um, uh, very important in establishing the role of, um, you know, secret files kept by uh, the army and bodies connected to it um, in uh, writing the narrative of Zionist history. Um, I'm asking this because it seems to be um, very impossible, um, very difficult to impossible to write proper history as long as most of those files are closed. And I, I just remind the listeners uh, the story of the village files, which uh, you have told us for the first time in your work, 
and um, which changed the understanding um, of the Nakba and, and how it was prepared uh, over a, a number of decades. Could you explain to us um, the difficulties a researcher such as yourself is facing? Yes, L let me start by saying that before I encountered uh, difficulties, before I was known as an anti-Zionist scholar, when I was still a, a PhD student, working on a doctorate in Oxford in the early 1980s, which already uh, uh, was based on uh, declassified documentation in Israeli uh, archives. Even then, I now understand that only 2%, only 2% of the important documents of uh, the Israeli army that uh, uh, pertain to what happened in 1948 were released to the public. Um, since 2016, even uh, these documents, or most of these documents, including the village files, which you mentioned, are not accessible to uh, most of the scholars, apart from a small group of scholars, which have some access to the documents. And as I explained in my talk, because uh, 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 there is a sense that they are working within in the acceptable lines of uh, exposing uh, what cannot be denied anymore, uh, that there were war crimes and, and massacres uh, and uh, expulsions in 1948. I cannot have any access to these documents. But I should say, and I wrote an article about it in the Journal of Palestine Studies, and I'm still working on a project on this, uh, at least in the period of the 1980s, many of us uh, in those days, uh, Xerox documents. So we don't have the original, but around the community of conscientious historians, we share a large number of documentation that I, I'm now uploading slowly uh, with the help of very nice people uh, on a new website that will soon be, be launched called the Indicative Archive of Palestine. Uh, this is, these are documents that are given to me by generous historians who have luckily Xerox uh, uh, these documents, which I don't think will be ever again accessible to future uh, historians. So this is difficult. But on the other hand, Chaim, and I'll end and I apologize for the long uh, answer, I still think that if we combine uh, the oral testimonies and the memoirs of the Israeli soldiers and officers who tell us much more than we, we probably expect from them to tell in published books, together with the documents that we can access, I think we have now quite a clear picture of the motivation for the ethnic cleansing its execution and uh, 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 its significance afterwards. Uh, and, and I think that every given document and new evidence that we have substantiates the big picture that we were drawing uh, a few years ago, uh, which is not going to change. That, the, that Israel intentionally and systematically committed a massive ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians that ended with the expulsion of half of the Palestinians, not because that was the objective, but because there was a limit to what they could have done in the face of some Palestinian resistance and in the face uh, and on the basis of their capacity, which was quite limited as a military force. Thank you. And now I would uh, like to open the question and answer session. You please turn your camera on if you would like to. Uh, and I'll ask people in the order that they uh, raise their hands. Arwa Shomar, could you please unmute yourself and ask the question? Yeah, I'm trying. Uh, first of all, hello, and thanks for uh, organizing this webinar. Uh, it's Arwa, and I'm from Gaza Strip. Um, I want to ask you if uh, the international community can do something about this crime and other crimes 
uh, or Israel is above the law and we cannot do anything for it. And if the international community can do something, what uh, it will be like? I mean, uh, what shape it will uh, take this punishment or whatever it will take. And thanks. Thank you, Arwa, uh, for, for your question. Uh, I think that uh, we can learn something from the campaign against the apartheid South Africa, uh, that there were two uh, uh, public domains, if you want, where uh, resistance to uh, the apartheid took place. One was in the civil society, and one was among the political elites and, and the governments. And also in the case of South Africa, it was much easier to galvanize civil society to join a campaign which we have now, in the case of Palestine, of boycott, divestment, and sanction to put pressure uh, on the state of Israel because of these crimes that we were talking about. But unlike in the case of South Africa, we have not managed yet to convince governments and political elites to move from uh, a social uh, a civil society boycott to governmental uh, sanctions. Uh, so I think we, we need to continue with this to make sure that first of all, people are not ignorant about the crimes, that we fight against their denial, uh, and we use every possible mean to uh, ask for justice. Uh, and if the international uh, uh, law uh, tribunals fail us, as they seem to fail us so far, we go to what we call in Arabic al sharia al duwaliya we go to the international legitimacy and ask for justice there, while of course people on the ground continue their resistance and are not going to cave in. Uh, and uh, this story is not over by, by any means, and the struggle uh, continues. So outside, I would say, uh, we now have quite a, quite a clear uh, uh, ideas of what we should do. We maybe are not doing enough, but I think we know what we should do, and probably we should do it even more uh, and, and, and in a more intensive uh, way. Thank you. Um, Ar Arwa, please remove your hand. Once you ask your question, remove your hand because it makes it difficult to see. Um, now, I want to ask you, John Hall, um, asked me to ask you, he um, can't ask it himself. And this is related to the last question. Can anyone tell me why even Amnesty International refuses to call dispossession and displacement ethnic cleansing? Yes, I think that there are two reasons for this. One is a little bit more acceptable. The other one is not acceptable. The more acceptable one is that um, in international law, uh, ethnic cleansing as such is more difficult to uh, define as a, as a crime against humanity, whereas international law, that is the, the official international law, has a lot of uh, references to, to apartheid. And I know from the, the, the discussions in Amnesty be, behind the scene, that, that this was one of the reasons, but I don't think it was the main reason. Um, I think that uh, it's very uh, uh, difficult, even for organizations who, uh, who really went a very long way uh, from their positions, let's say of 10 or 20 years ago, to fully use the vocabulary which is needed to be used in order to frame precisely and accurately what goes on uh, in historical Palestine today and what happened uh, in the past. Uh, but I think this is not the last document. And, and uh, I would say that one of the encouraging, maybe the most encouraging uh, <clears throat> uh, passage in that uh, uh, report, and I don't know if all of you read it carefully as, as I did, <coughs> I'm sorry. The most important, I think, is the fact that there is a reference to uh, the framing of Israel as an apartheid state, not as a polemic position, but as an outcome of uh, 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 scholarly research. And this is something we should pay attention to. Uh, more and more uh, 
framings and references to the past and the present in Palestine, which used to be part of the dictionary or vocabulary of pro-Palestinian activists or the Palestinian national movement, and were regarded as, as uh, uh, political uh, expressions of a certain narrative, are now more and more quoted as the outcome of an academic research. Uh, this is very important. Uh, I'm not saying that this is the, 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 the message of the liberation of Palestine and that tomorrow things would unfold differently on the ground. But I think that this is a very important step in the struggle over uh, the consciousness uh, of people and, and their uh, conscience and our ability uh, to fight the denial uh, of what happened in 48 and what happens today as part of our struggle for liberation. Uh, before I ask Tony to um, uh, ask his question, you can, um, you can um, unmute yourself, Tony. I just want to ask you, Elon, to answer um, a, a question about the, the, the name of the film and how to see it. Um, people uh, here will love to see the film, I'm sure, yeah. and we would like to organize that. So could you answer that? Yeah, I, I didn't make the film. I'm, I, I, the we film know. is not mine, uh, uh, but I could definitely connect uh, Haim with the uh, director, and uh, I'm sure that we'll find a way to, uh, to screen it. Uh, and uh, if you want even to have a conversation with the director itself, I, I can definitely help in this. Uh, I did not make the film. I'm not sure I would have made the film in such a way myself. Uh, neither would I have written a thesis on Tantura the way Katz wrote it. I think that's very important for me uh, to say this. Both Alon and Katz define themselves as Zionists. And that's what make the, the story, if you want, more intriguing but also allows us, of course, to understand what else needs to be done uh, if uh, uh, the Nakba denial is going to be an organic part of the struggle for liberation. Thank you. And Tony, go ahead. Hi, Ilan. Uh, very, very interesting talk. What happened to uh, Teddy Katz was on a human level, absolutely outrageous. And I'm trying to organize a petition absolutely. to actually demand of Haifa that they reinstate his degree, apologize to him and compensate him for the distress that he's suffered. Do you agree that would be very useful? The second point I'd like to make is, I think this episode demonstrates the complicity of Israeli academia and its universities in Zionist colonization and the narrative, and it lends support to the academic boycott because one of the arguments, of course, is that the Israeli universities are a neutral island amidst the troubles that are going on. So would you agree that this is a very important issue in terms of busting the myth that Israeli universities stand apart from the occupation and the apartheid and all the other evils? Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Uh, yes, first of all, I, I do think it would be very useful and uh, it would uh, to, to do such a, uh, to prepare such a petition and, and to, to arrange it. Uh, there is, by the way, a petition of surprisingly 100 Israeli academics inside Israel uh, with a similar demand from Haifa University to uh, uh, give Teddy Katz back his a title is uh, yeah his degree i'm sorry his degree uh, and uh, they they are not asking for compensation and i think you're absolutely right tony to bring up compensation as such uh, I, I just want to to i don't know if it will make you all more optimistic or not but uh, in 2001 i appealed to the 900 israeli academics who were serving in israeli universities and asked for support I got six letters of support. Uh, four of them were from Israeli academics who haven't been in Israel for 20 years. Uh, so um, this is encouraging in a way, uh, and, but I will let you all think whether, whether this is a meaningful thing, but I'm, I'm surprised at the different uh, 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 approach. Uh, 
compared to, to 2001. As for your second question, Tony, yes, I agree. I think what is unique in this, uh, and I, I didn't have enough time in one talk to do this, uh, unique, Tony, is that it is a forensic exposure of the mechanism that this is being done. And I myself and Haim as well and others, we were, we were succumbed to a similar treatment by the Israelis. I think you have to understand this, and, and Haim knows this very well himself. What I'm talking about is that you are not silenced in Israel just like that. People are not saying, okay, you cannot say that there was a massacre. They always try to say that we don't have a problem uh, with uh, your statement that there were war crimes or ethnic cleansing or even genocide. The problem is that you are not a good scholar. That's the problem. And in Teddy Katz's case, it was the most, ob uh, it was so obvious because everybody agreed that the prosecution uh, and uh, the committees, the various committees the university organized detected few places where there were discrepancies between what he recorded on the tapes and the way he transcribed them in the thesis, right? And he corrected all of them. And the university was uh, in a problem here. So what do you do? He corrected everything. Then they said, no, no. The problem is not anymore the discrepancies. The problem is that actually when we ask, when we read the thesis again, it is a very bad dissertation. So he needs to write another one. So he wrote foolishly, by the way, I would have never agreed. He wrote another one. And then they had this uh, idea that you have five anonymous examiners, nobody has in Israel five anonymous examiners for a master dissertation. Uh, three of them, we, and I know all the names, Israel is a small place, nobody is anonymous in Israel, never was. And, and three of them are friends of the university and they were, they knew exactly the hatch, hatching job that they were doing. This mechanism is important because for some people in the West, this, uh, facade of professionalism and this, and, and this statement, we don't have a problem with people who criticize Israel as academics. The problem is that they're not good academics is, is, is one of the main weapons that they're using, but I think it's less and less efficient, but I agree with you. It's, it's about the complicity, but we have now a better idea how the complicity works uh, because we don't always have uh, a good proof for that complicity, but we are, we are getting there more and more. Thanks. I just want to put into numerical context what Ilan said. Uh, there are 22,000 academics in Israel and a hundred, including myself, signed this call. Um, when we wrote it, I suggested that um, a study center um, devoted to studying the crimes of 1948 and later will be set up um, to demand that uh, such a center will be set up by Haifa University dedicated uh, to the work um, of um, um, Teddy Katz, who has been so badly hurt by the university and uh, unjustifiably. Uh, interesting that the people who decided that were members of the hundred did not put that demand mm -hmm. forward. Uh, this is academics uh, who do not agree to uh, create uh, a study center. I, I think that tells us something. Uh, Samir Shawa, uh, please ask your question, but remember to unmute. Please ask your question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the uncovering of Tartura massacre is appreciated and uh, definitely welcome news. Uh, uh, actually, if, uh, the uh, Elan mentioned that uh, he, they, they are preparing a proposed new website to gather more information. And I'm in, uh, actually in uh, getting more details about the post Nakba. <coughs> Uh, massacres, like in 1956, the massacre in Khan Yunis, and in 67, massacre in Rafah, where there are still people living, you know, in, in Gaza who can 
really provide information so it, it could be posted or sent to the, the new uh, website. Is mm -hmm. that uh, a possibility? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Samir. It definitely, uh, it, the idea is not just to focus on on 48, but uh, as we say in Arabic, al nakba al mustamirra the ongoing Nakba. In that respect, yes, I think this is very important. M my more long-term dream is to actually create in London a center for uh, Nakba against Nakba denial uh, that would really have a, a physical space where we could make sure that people, especially in Britain, do not forget uh, uh, what happened. But yes, definitely. So we can be in touch and, and we would love to upload uh, these. It's very interesting that uh, maybe maybe also natural. Um, refugees, and, and you know it, Samir, refugees who came to, to Lebanon, the West Bank, Syria, later on to, to, to Iraq, especially refugees who went to refugee camps, the first thing on their mind was not to tell the stories of massacres. The, the first thing on their mind was to survive in I'm impossible sorry. conditions. And later on, there was no one there who asked them about the massacres and, and so on. And, and you know, I, 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 the last visit I had to Faradis where some of the survivors of the, of the uh, massacre live, there are still people who don't want to talk to me about what happened. I know exactly what happened. And I say, why? They said, well, you know, we are Israeli citizens now. Uh, the Israelis will take away all our rights if we talk about the massacre. Uh, they will harass us, persecute us. Um, and and on, that's one side of the coin. The second side of the coin is that suddenly a group of survivors from a village called Mayroon, Mayroon, which is now the Israeli settlement Meron, told us of, of something we were not aware of the, of the massacre. We knew there was a massacre in my room, but we didn't have the details. And, and they are very old, but they have a very good memory of what happened there, which was, again, I don't want to go to the horrific details of what the Israelis did in my room. So yes, these things have to be accumulated because killings of that kind were not accidents. There were methods, and they explained the dehumanization of any settler colonial project, including the Zionist one. And this is why Israeli soldiers today in the West Bank and, and sniper on the border with the Gaza Strip do not think twice when they take the life either of a Palestinian child or a, 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 an older Palestinian person. The dehumanization allows these kinds of crime to be committed and if we don't face them, they will still be committed uh, in the future. So thank you, Samir, for that, and we'll be in touch for sure. Thank you, Ilan. The next question is by Rehab Sharida. Please um, unmute Rehab. Hi, you can hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Great. Great. Uh, firstly, thank you so much, Ilan, for tonight and just uh, for your work in general. I can't explain in words how much it means, uh, how much it's meant for, for my work. Um, basically, I mean, I wanted to ask you about, I agree with what you're saying about the persuasiveness of the perpetrators' testimonies regarding the Nakba massacres. My work and research about the massacre in my village, Sopsaf, which neighbors Mayron, as you know, yes. um, is almost completely based on testimonies of the survivors. Um, and I mean, who mostly live in Ain al refugee camp and Badawi uh, refugee camp in Lebanon. In Lebanon. Um, like since the language and understanding of Zionism and the connection between ethnic cleansing and massacre in 1948 and the present are clearer, do you believe the world can be more receptive to the stories and documentations about our history that are survivor-based and self-determining in that sense? I mean, another way of asking this is, you know, outside of the Israeli bubble, how ready is the world for Palestinian testimonies? I mean, it's it's very indicative, isn't it, of the racism that Palestinian testimonies are, yeah. you know, denied and, and not believed. But, you know, just, yeah, how ready do you think the world is for the, you know, without the, do we need the Israeli testimonies to kind of validate? Thank you, Rehab. 
thank you very much. Um, that's a very, very good question. I, I, I think, you know, I believe that these things are dialectical and I explain what I mean by that. I think there was a moment in the 1990s and it was not a nice moment. It's, it's, in a way, it was a bit of an ugly moment that the Western academic uh, uh, institutions needed the new histories of Israel to legitimize the Palestinian narrative or ironically, you can kind of call it kosherize the Palestinian uh, uh, narrative. And uh, I remember giving a talk in, 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 in Birzeit in uh, 1987, 1988, and there was a lot of indignation, which I fully understood by young Palestinian students who said, you know, you know uh, uh, why do we need the new history of Israel uh, for the world? Why did the, the world needs the new history to hear ourselves? And I, I, I said then, and I say today, I'm, I'm not, I don't think that this is, a particularly pleasant fact of life, but it is a fact of life. However, uh, Rehab, I don't think that this is the case now outside of Israel. I think that if your work would be based even exclusively, even exclusively on survivors' uh, testimonies, something has happened since the appearance of the works of the new historians in the late 1990s. And this is the juxtaposition of Palestinian evidence vis-a-vis -vis Israeli military evidence in the public eye, first about the second Intifada, then about the second Lebanon war, and more importantly, probably than anything else, on what occurs in the Gaza Strip. And I think that the pendulum has uh, uh, switched. And, and uh, if anybody has a problem with basing their narrative on their own testimonies, it is the Israelis and not the Palestinians anymore. Uh, uh, so, so I think you are in a far better, I would say academic and uh, public environment for using such material in order to uh, inform us and expand our understanding on, uh, on, on the Nakba. It doesn't mean that we should not continue to strive and get as much documentation as we can uh, uh, for those sections in the Western society. And maybe if we are optimistic about expanding the, the anti-Zionist camp inside Israel and recruit some of the liberal Zionists to that, uh, maybe there we still, you still need the voice of the perpetrator to make uh, a crime, a crime in their eyes. But I think uh, at least there's so many bad news about in the struggle against denial. Uh, uh, but this one, I think something positive has occurred uh, in recent years. Thank you, Ilan. Uh, I just want to say to people listening on Facebook that if uh, you have questions, please um, use the CC button and uh, put your com questions as a comment, and then I will see and invite um, the question and, and ask the question for you because you can't use your microphone. Um, there is also a question by someone, uh, I cannot see who, um, but it's an important question, uh, Ilan. What is happening to the mass grave? Has it been excavated or will it be excavated in the presence of suitable witnesses? Yes, a very good uh, question. A uh, few things have to be said about the mass graves. Because of the documents we have from, from the army and because of the uh, uh, technology used by uh, uh, the uh, filmmaker, uh, and when you juxtapose both, you, you, we know that after the, uh, uh, the mass graves were dug, uh, 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 the, some of the bodies were um, taken out of the mass graves, and we don't know where they were taken to. That's the first point. So um, it, we, we have a very good uh, uh, photographic, uh, kind of forensic photography that shows us exactly where the mass graves, we don't know yet uh, uh, how many people are there. And we have this documentation that tells us that there were so many bodies that they decided then to move many of them 
God knows uh, to where. Uh, we cannot excavate, it belongs to the kibbutz, uh, and I doubt whether they will allow us to excavate. I wanted, by the way, to excavate the graves. In, I was willing to pay for my own money in 2000, and I was thrown out uh, uh, from the kibbutz. Um, I do think that our next steps, the two steps that we are planning, when I say we, there's a group of people in different combination, uh, uh, informal and more formal organizations who are dealing now with Stantura. One is a legal uh, process which has just begun to try and declare at least the location of the mass graves as a sacred location so that people would uh, be able to visit it and so on, even if they don't allow uh, excavation. Uh, no less important, I think we are now understand, and this was the film to its credit brought to my attention and other people's attention. We, we, I think it is important to exhume the massacres uh, through the graves in historical Palestine, wherever we can. We didn't deal with this aspect. I must say to our shame as historians, look at every history you have of ethnic cleansing in, in your library, locating the killing fields and what happened to the survivors is a very important part of the historiographical research. I understand why we didn't do it, but I think we should try and do it. It's, it's very, very uh, uh, important. Uh, and, uh, and it took time, for instance, for us to expose the prisoner camps. Uh, we needed Salman Abu Sitta with his energy, endless energy, uh, in the 1990s to tell us you have not looked at one of the most important aspects of the ethnic cleansing, which is uh, 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 hard labor uh, prisoners camps that uh, the Red Cross was uh, quite uh, 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 surprised at the, the brutality and inhumanity that prevailed in those camps. And, and we have the documents now in the International Red Cross archives. So yes, I, I think that we are uh, doing what we can. I don't think excavation will take place very soon. I don't think excavation will expose all the people who were uh, uh, killed. Um, it's a bit late, in, but we will have to go back and, and, and do this uh, because uh, uh, it is an important layer. It's not the exclusive layer of the ethnic cleansing, but it's an important layer that I think all of us, whoever uh, dealt as a professional historian, uh, uh, somehow neglected, as I say, for obvious reasons, but that doesn't mean we will not focus on it in the future. Thank you. And the next question comes from our friend Carl Sabach. Carl, please unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, hi, Elan. Hi, Thank Carl. You. Thank you. Riveting as usual. Um, I just want to pick up on the, um, the general discounting in Israel anyway of survivor stories. When, if you look at what we know about the Holocaust, it's almost entirely based on Jews telling us in great detail what happened, uh, often 10, 20, 30 years after the events. Does this, does this never occur to Israelis, the, the sort of inconsistency between ignoring Palestinian survivors' stories and yet accepting Jewish ones? No, I, I don't think, Carl, uh, it, it, it uh, really uh, influences uh, the overall Israeli attitude to the words of the validity of any kind of Palestinian statesman, whether it is on something that happened in the past, whether it is their own interpretation of what happens in the present or their aspirations uh, for the future. It is quite incredible. Uh, and uh, I think that this discrepancy that you, you described rightly between the uh, sanctity of Jewish uh, uh, testimonies from the Holocaust and the total uh, uh, disregard for Palestinian testimonies from the Nakba is just one aspect of the way uh, uh, Palestinians and Israelis, uh, Israeli Jews are treated within the state of Israel. Go to the criminal courts and you will see that discrimination in action. 
uh, go to the um, a public uh, uh, domain, whether it is the parliament, uh, the media talk shows, uh, and you will see a similar uh, attitude. Uh, a Palestinian uh, uh, evidence is ridiculed, disbelieved, uh, and an Israeli Jewish evidence is taken as the truth uh, uh, itself. Uh, so yes, this is part of the reality we need to deal with. But as I say to Rehab, I, I think outside of Israel, something is happening. Uh, uh, and, and I think, I'm, if I'm not over optimistic, there are some changes in Israel itself about it. Uh, among what we used to call liberal Zionists, it's a bit too much for them to try and totally disregard. But as Haim noted with his uh, communication with the people who wrote the petition on behalf of Teddy Katz, they're still very much inhibited by their Zionism uh, to, to take what I would call the extra half mile outside that ideology. Uh, to, to... Sorry, um, had a, a, a slight problem. Uh, there is another question. Um, I'm not sure by whom. Um, thanks for bringing this horrific evidence to light. How can the true scale of the violence during the Nakba be further exposed? This is especially uh, an important question in the light of the film. Uh, I mean, are we to wait for filmmakers um, or are there other ways um, that we can act to uh, spread the knowledge? Well, I think that uh, in the last 10 or 15 years, a lot of individuals, formal and informal outfits are working on it. Uh, there is a huge new, uh, relatively new archive of oral testimonies in Beirut that wasn't there before. I talked about our own initiative in Exeter of the indicative uh, archive. Uh, Birzet University has expanded its interest in the Nakba and are gathering their own uh, 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 material. So uh, I think that we are doing what we can to expand the historical picture. Um, uh, uh, the the uh, idea that the filmmaker had is something that occurred to me and my friend Eyal Sivan a few years ago we suddenly understood that the Israeli soldier on the deathbed, so to speak, are willing to say things they were un, uh, unwilling to say beforehand. And uh, we interviewed 33 Israeli soldiers who told us horrific uh, stories of what they have done themselves, uh, uh, complimenting some uh, 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 or filling some lacuna we had in, uh, uh, for example, uh, the history of what happened in Alid, what happened in uh, villages around Tabaria, uh, and some other places where uh, we we're, we're missing some uh, evidence. So um, we are thinking out of the box all the time. Uh, we really believe that this is important. We, we are absolutely sure that we are not using graphic description for the sake of graphic description. We know exactly our moral commitment and, uh, uh, and our moral standing in this, in doing that. Uh, there is a real uh, hum humane uh, uh, aspect to this work uh, and it's very strong conviction and belief that this is an essential part. In fact, the most important part uh, on the way to a future possible reconciliation and liberation. Uh, and, and therefore, I don't think uh, my generation would stop doing it. And I know that the younger generation continues to do it and will continue to do that. The next question comes from Mayor Amor. Mayor, please unmute. unmute. Hi, Ilan. Thank you very much Hi, for, Mayor. Your, for your wonderful lecture and important. Uh, uh, presentation. I would like to ask you if you have any 
explanation for the Israeli Jewish politics of denial beyond the uh, obvious or justification or justifying the Zionist project. What, who, what are the forces that shape that politics of denial? Yeah, a very good question, Mayor. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, this goes even uh, to a much more fundamental question about Zionism. This is my understanding, but I might be wrong. And I'm writing a, a book about it now, which is called Lobbying for Zionism on Both Sides of the Atlantic. I feel that from the very beginning, even the most devout uh, 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 Zionists, at, whether it's in the early stages of the colonization in Palestine, or whether it was in the early years of statehood, who were in many ways either building or constructing the cultural system, the value system, the indoctrination, if you want, that was supposed to, to uphold the project of Zionism before 48 and the project of Israel uh, after 1948, I think most of these people, and that's what I'm trying to show in the book, were aware that there was a moral problem. Moral problem of timing, that Zionism uh, took the question of, took the conversation of colonization at a time when the conversation began to be awkward. Uh, and you can see at, at, at how in 1920, the Zionist spokesperson outside of Palestine do not use anymore the word colonization. In 1919, it appears in every official document of Zionists. When they recruit money and support, they ask to support the colonization of Palestine. Something happens in 1920, and they say, this is not the right way to convince people to, 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 uh, to uh, support us. And they use the question of redemption, and return and the empty land, uh, all kinds of things that are supposed to take away colonization out of the equation. But they knew that it was not correct. I don't think they eluded themselves. They, didn't, they may have lied to others, but I don't think they lied to themselves. And I think this is true about 48. You know, you know yourself from the Israeli author like Samech Izhar, from the way Martin Buber wrote you know, he, he, he played the innocent when he said, uh, I listened to testimonies of my students in Jerusalem, and I couldn't believe my ears for what they told me that they have done in 48. He believed his ears. He knew before the students what happened in 48. He was in Palestine in 1948. You could not avoid seeing what happened. And so it's all around this de uh, uh, denial, first of all, for domestic consumption that you you if you if you don't if you rest for one moment in the project of denial a far more important problem would emerge which is the moral validity of the project and the moral validity of the state so i don't think that denial is the main issue i think that denial is one of the last shields in order that the discussion would not be about the pro moral problem of taking someone else's homeland knowingly, not unknowingly, knowingly. And, and, and official Israel, of course, today weaponizes anti-Semitism in order to, to prevent that kind of discussion. Uh, but, but I think that uh, this is a, a one reason. I want to add just one more sentence, Mayor. I think it's not working too well. I can see it when I come to Israel. It's not working too well. And because it's not working too well, they, they did this impossible thing in 2016. They took a unit in the Ministry of Defense that's supposed to protect Israel's nuclear secrets. You know, the Mal Malmab. It really deals with Israel's most uh, horrific <laughs> secrets about biological weapons. And they uh, gave them another assignment to make sure it is the most stupid explanation I've ever heard that if we won't allow people to see the documents about 1948, 
we will be able to sustain the deny. They didn't say it, of course, in such words. What the head of the MAP said to Haaretz in 2016 is, if I would allow historians, like the new historians, to see the documents, they will not be able to tell what happened in 1948. Uh, it, 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 Israel arrived in a, a pathetic, to its pathetic stage as a country. It's a very fearful country. It's a very powerful state. But morally, it is a very pathetic state. Uh, there are examples in history of pathetic uh, morally states with a very lot with, with a lot of power. So it doesn't mean that it doesn't have the power to sustain it. But I think it, uh, uh, whereas the, the the struggle for denial was very sophisticated, I think nowadays it's not very sophisticated, and it's not very successful. I just want to add a sentence to what Ilan um, said about the Malmab and the interview in Haaretz in 2016. Um, another question to the same man was, what do we do about documents that were already seen by people like Ilan and uh, have written about this? And his answer was very open. He said, if I remove the documents now, they don't exist, do they? So they can't bring them and show them to anyone. So they don't exist. So they have nothing to base uh, the claim on. So th this is an, an, an interview to, uh, to our arts. Uh, they have no shame. There are more questions coming. Ilan, um, this is uh, gonna be a long day, it seems. Um, Diana Neslin, please ask your question and unmute before. What a thank you so much, Ilan, for a most fascinating presentation. I'm particularly, I find it very difficult when I visited Israel that they seem to have no concept of what of racism or indeed of equal rights. It seemed to be something beyond their capacity. I don't know if you agree with me, but I found do you feel that um, Israelis understand the concept of racism? Uh, it's a very good uh, question. Um, <clears throat> there are two examples, like well, three ex short examples I can think of, and maybe that that's that is instead of a kind of a more structural answer. And I, I apologize for that. One is the way the Jews who arrived from Arab and Muslim countries were treated in the 1950s. Now, it's very clear that what we have in the archives shows us uh, an utterly ugly and racist attitude to Jews who came from Iraq, uh, Morocco, uh, Algeria, and so on. I, I, I don't have the time to, to repeat everything they said, but definitely not only the language, the way these people were treated was out of racism by European Jews towards non-European Jews. Um, it's interesting that if you ask uh, Israelis today uh, about that period, they would say, yes, there was racism towards uh, 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 Jews who came from Arab and Muslim countries, uh, but uh, the situation now is much, much better. Um, so that's one, one uh, example where racism was a little bit in the public domain, uh, but not with regard to the Palestinians. The second example are the Ethiopian Jews who really suffered from racism due to their color. And they talk about racism. They have committees against racism. But typical to Israel, it's all politics of identity. What do I mean by that? Uh, that their victimization based on color does not make them at any way sensitive to the racism towards the Palestinians. And they would serve in the border police that does the most horrific things to Palestinians at, uh, at uh, check, uh, checkpoints uh, in, in, uh, uh, the Gaza, in, in the West Bank. They serve in the riot police that brutally uh, uh, beats Palestinian demonstrators inside Israel. So there is a sense of a limited racism towards a certain group, but when you come, and that's my third example, if you at all try to have a conversation in Israel, that the, at the heart of the Zionist and after that Israeli attitude towards the Palestinians 
is racism, then you are uh, being encountered with uh, the typical Israeli answer, no, no, this is all about security. This is a national security issue. It's nothing to do uh, with race. And it has everything uh, uh, to do uh, with race, of course. Um, I want to bring Ronit Lentin, a good friend, to ask her question. Uh, could you unmute, Ronit? OK. Uh, thank you, Ilan, for, as usual, a fascinating um, presentation. And a lot of the things you, you said in answer to the questions actually answer my, my question. But my main issue is the sense that we, the main enemies in, in our main kind of rivals in trying to move on to a more progressive situation and not necessarily the right wing. We know what they think, they are very explicit, they're very racist, they're very clear. It's really the liberal Zionist camp particularly the members of the government at the moment, merits, labor, and people of them in Yeshatid and so on and so forth. Now, how do we get over that part of the population, trying to bring them together with us? And how do we get over to the world the fact that there's been no change in this government and things are just as bad? And the fact what we need to do is to eradicate Zionism itself in all its shape and try and, and join our Palestinian colleagues and comrades in some degree of optimism that things indeed can change. Thank you, Roni. Uh, it's interesting. I had uh, a conversation with Alon, the director, who, as I said, would de define himself as a liberal Zionist. And he is sure that uh, the film would change the liberal Zionist attitudes towards uh, uh, the Nakba. And both Udi Aloni, my friend, and myself, we said to him, it would help if you would think about the implication of what you found uh, uh, to your attitude towards Zionism, which at this moment in time, he refuses uh, uh, to see. So he himself is an example of why it is so difficult to, to go over that I'm, I'm, I'm still hopeful uh, with him. He's not a lost case, um, uh, and I, I can be, I hope, persuasive on this. But uh, it is, it is a very difficult task that you are asking us uh, to do, Ronit, but a doable one. The problem is that it's a very uh, uh, time-consuming and energy-consuming. Uh, dialogue that can have some positive uh, uh, results. I know it for myself. Uh, I'm doing post podcasts in Hebrew. I used to have, uh, when I was still living in Israel, a home university where liberal Zionists came. Uh, and uh, I think I had some influence in my two years workshops with them. Uh, one of my sons said to me that I should not despair because it took me two years to convince 50 Jewish, Jew, Israeli Jews. He calculated, he said that all I need was 500 years and there will be a sizable number of Israeli Jews who would uh, think in a different way. Uh, but seriously speaking, I, I think that um, a, a film like this, even if the director itself does not contextualize it the way I would like to contextualize it, is important uh, because it uh, uh, was accepted by Sundance, it opened the Sundance uh, Festival. Uh, and I think I learned it from the new history and the critique on Zionism in, inside the Israeli academia. It hit a wall there, but it did not hit a wall outside of Israel. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I think there was much more influence outside Israel than was inside Israel. Um, Optimism about it is, is, is necessary, I agree, but it has to be, of course, injected with realism, Ronit, and, and this is, will be a long process. I think it will, it will be a successful process. I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, pessimistic in that sense because I, I've been involved like you in this, maybe less than you in terms of years, but I can see the changes uh, uh, in many 
uh, as, uh, parts of society. Uh, and I think that um, uh, there are uh, signs that in the long run, uh, uh, whatever we, uh, we would like to achieve in decolonizing historical Palestine, which of course means de-Zionizing historical Palestine, uh, is, is much less utopian, I think, actually today, ironically, because Israel has uh, lost its liberal Zionist base, because it doesn't have any more uh, a, a serious constituency that is liberal Zionist, and it is exposed as a right-wing fascist uh, state that uh, is much more uh, accepted because of its power uh, than because of its moral uh, validity. Uh, so, so I think this is uh, not a moment to, to despair, uh, uh, but there's a whole other issues we won't go into, which do not depend on you and me, Ronit. There are many, many issues that have to be resolved on the Palestinian side to exploit what I think is a good moment in history to push forward the decolonization of Palestine. And my hopes are about the fact that there is a younger Palestinian generation, I saw them in action in May 2021, uh, who are able to work together beyond party affiliation, beyond geographical boundaries, uh, redefine the Palestinian liberation project in the 21st century. And when this particular project would be completed, and I think it will be completed, it would be much easier to provide a more effective international solidarity uh, for the decolonization and liberation of Palestine. Thank you very much, Ilan. Uh, and it will be very good to end on a positive note. So I want to invite May Ramor, uh, who heads the um, only radical organization of academics in Israel, uh, to say few words about Academia for Equality, which represents 700 academics and its activities are on the memory of the Nakba and other related questions. Mayor, please. Thank you very much, Chaim. Um, I would say just a few words about this organization. It's a grassroots organization of academics in Israel and outside of Israel. Many of our members are Palestinian Israelis, and we are trying to do the best we can on various sides of the issue of equality in Israel, um, whether we are working on uh, equality within the universities, even with uh, staff working at the university, uh, or as far as dealing and trying to do some uh, public events concerning Tantura and the Nakba. So we are working on a vast a, a huge number of subjects and um, uh, we are growing but not as big as we want. We are noticeable now a little bit more than we were two or three years ago. Uh, hopefully our voice will be heard in a better or in a more clearer fashion, but we have quite a bit of work to do. Um, for example, in May 21, we organized an ad hoc committee to assist Palestinian students who were attacked in various universities. And we have done that quite uh, 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 fast and we were able to uh, provide some assistance, quite essential assistance. Uh, of course, we could not do uh, uh, tremendous things, but we, we were there and we were trying to assist and we are still keeping that system alive and we are building uh, hopefully better communication and better networks with Palestinian scholars and students. And hopefully we'll uh, do something about change. That's it. I think that that uh, would be okay, Chaim, isn't it? Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, the first meeting about the Tantura events after the film was indeed held by your organization and Elon spoke there and many others, and it was an excellent event. That's uh, correct. Thank you, uh, all of you, but mainly 
and especially thank you, Ilan, for a fascinating evening. I get many, many thank yous on the uh, chat. It was um, what we are used to, but always appreciate, Ilan. Thank, thank you. you very much. Continue thank your you. good work. And good evening to all of you, whether you're members of JNP or not. If you're not members, why are you not members? Please join. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.